So the humerus articulates with the scapula proximally at the glenohumeral joint. So it participates in the movements of the shoulder. And also your humerus has the distal articulations with the radius and ulna of the elbow joint. Next slide, please. So your greater tubercle lies just lateral in the distal to the anatomic neck and provides attachments for the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and your teres minor muscle. And the lesser tubercle lies on the anterior medial side of the humerus, just distal to the anatomic neck, and it provides an insertion for the subscapularis muscle. Like this. Your intertubercular group or your bicipital group lies between the greater and your lesser tubercles and it lodges the tendon of the long head of the biceps fracti muscle and is bridged by the transverse humeral ligament and it provides an insertion for the pectoralis major on its lateral lip, the teres major on its medial lip, and the latissimus dorsi on the floor. <coughs> Next slide please. So the surgical neck is a narrow area distal to the tubercles that is common is a common site of your fracture and is in contact with the axillary nerve and the posterior humeral circumflex artery. And your deltal tuberosity is a rough triangular elevation on the lateral aspects of the mid shaft that marks the insertion of the deltoid muscle. So there are regions of your humerus which is a, a usual area of your fracture like the yeah, fractures of the greater tuberosity, the fractures of the lesser tuberosity, and also the fractures of the surgical neck, which may injure the axial nerves and the posterior humeral circumflex artery as they pass through the quadrangular space. Next slide, please. So your spiral groove uh, in this area contains the radial nerve, separating the region of the lateral head of the triceps above and the region of the medial head below. So this is a uh, the red drawing on the found in your shaft, based on the picture. And your trochlea, which is a spool-shaped medial articular surface and articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna. Next slide, please. So the capitulum is a lateral articular surface on the which is globular in shape and it articulates with the head of the radius. And the olecranon fossa is a posterior depression above the trochlea of the humerus that houses the olecranon of the ulna on full extensions of the forearm. Next slide, please. Also, your coronoid fossa, an anterior depression above the trochlea of the humerus that accommodates the coronoid process of the ulna on flexions of the elbow. The radial fossa is an anterior depression above the capitulum that is occupied by the head of the root radius during your full flexion of the elbow joint. Next slide, please. And lastly, your lateral epicondyle, which projects from the capitulum and provides the region of the supinator and the extensor muscles of the forearm. So it is an attachment site for the radial collat collateral ligament. And also your medial epicondyle, which provides from the trochlea and has a group on the back of the ulnar nerve and superior ulnar collateral artery. So this area provides an attachment site for the ulnar collateral ligament, the pronator teres, and the common tendon of the forearm flexor muscles. Slide, please. So now we'll proceed on the radius, in which your radius and your ulna are the two bones of the forearm. So they articulate with the humerus at the elbow and with the carpal bones on the wrist. So in the anatomical position, the radius sits on the lateral aspects of the forearm while your ulna is found medially. So the radius and the ulna articulates with each other at the proximal and the distal uh, radioulnar joints while their bodies are connected by your interosseous membrane. So these two joints allow the radius to move around the ulna, giving us the um, movement of palm facing up or your palm facing down position so the forearm. So the uh, areas of your radius, um, your head, which is found at the proximal end, which articulates with the capitulum of the humerus and the radial notch of the ulna, and is surrounded by your annular ligament. And 
Your neck, which is enclosed by the lower margin of the annular ligament, and the neck and the head are free from capsular attachment and thus can rotate freely within the socket. Next slide, please. The distal end of your radius articulates with the proximal row of the carpal bones and including the scaphoid, lunate, and the triquetral bones, but excludes the pisiform bone. Your radial tuberosity is an oblong prominence just distal to the neck and provides an attachment site for the biceps brachii tendon. Next slide, please. <coughs> your styloid process is located on the distal end of the radius and it approximately one centimeter distal to that of the ulna and it provides an insertion of your bacteriogialis muscle and it can be palpated in the proximal part of the anatomic snuff box between the extensor pollicis longus and your brevis tendons next slide please your ulna which is the smaller bone then your radius First, uh, the first set would be the olecranon, is the curved projection on the back of the elbow that provides an attachment site for the triceps tendon. And your coronoid process is located below the trochlear notch and provides an attachment site for the brachialis. Your trochlear notch, which receives the trochlea of the humerus. Next slide, please. Your ulnar tuberosity, which is a rough and prominence distal to the coronoid process that provides an attachment site for the brachialis, your radial notch, which accommodates the head of the radius at the proximal radioulnar joint, and the head, which is on the distal end, articulates with the articular disc of the distal radioulnar joint and has a styloid process. Next slide, please. So next to be discussed will be your bones on the hand. So we have your carpal bones, which, which is arranged in two rows and four from lateral to medial, which is your scaphoid, lunate, regretrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and your hamid. As you can see uh, at the right side, looks like this. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, so for your carpal bone, we have your proximal row. Again, from lateral to medial, we have your scaphoid, which is the largest, most lateral carpal bone of your proximal row. Um, it is structured frequently by impact on the base of your hand when the wrist is hyperextended and abducted. Next will be your lunate, which is a semilunar shaped carpal bone and it's located between your scaphoid and your triquetrum. Um, your triquetrum is a pyramidal shape, uh, which is the most medial bone in the proximal room. Next will be your tissue form, uh, which is a small T shaped sesamoid bone formed in your tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. Like so, for your distal row, um, from, again from lateral to medial, you have your trapezium, <coughs> trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So, for trapezium, um, this is the most lateral carpal bone in your distal row. Um, it forms a saddle joint with the first metacarpal bone, allowing the great mobility of your thumb. While your trapezoid um, is located with your, it is located between the trapezium and your capitate. So we have also your capitate, which is central, and, and this is the largest carpal bone, and it's located between, between your trapezoid and your hamate. <coughs> Excuse me. We have your hamate. Um, it is the most middle bone in your distal carpal row. So that is uh, one of the distinct, distinct, distinguishing feature of your hamate is your hamulus, uh, which is one of the one of the attachment points of your flexome, flexor retinaculum. Next slide, please. So for, uh, after, uh, we have also your metacarpals, which consists of your five bones located between the carpal bones and your phalanges. Um, it comprises of your body of the hand, uh, whereas your phalanges make up the fingers. So um, in your metacarpals, it consists of your base, which is your proximal ends, your shaft, which, which is your body, and head, which is your distal ends. So your first metacarpal bone of the tongue is the shortest and the most mobile. Like so this is your metacarpal bone, which consists of your head, body, and base. Like this. So, um, next will be your phalanges, which are the bones that comprise the digits of your hand. So, it consists also of your base, body, and head. So, the thumb has two phalanges, which is your fixed 
proximal and distal, whereas your digit has three palages, which is your proximal, middle, and distal. Each hand has uh, 14 pal palages in total. So this is a summary uh, of your carpal, metacarpals, and palanges. Um, on the left side, you can see your anterior view of your left hand, while on the right side, this is the posterior view of your left hand. Okay, for when we discuss about joints and ligaments of the upper limb, so the first joint uh, we could see in the upper limb is the acromioclavicular joint. So this is a plain synovial joint that allows gliding movement when the scapula rotates and is reinforced by the coracoclavicular ligament. It consists of two ligaments, the conoid and the trapezoid ligament. And also the next joint in the upper limb is the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, this is a double synovial plane joint. It has a gliding motion united by a fibrous capsule. This is reinforced by three ligaments, the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligament, the inter interclavicular ligament, and the postoclavicular ligament. The motion for this joint allows elevation and depression, protraction and retraction, and also circumduction of the shoulder. Next slide, please. For the... Uh, Shoulder joint or the glenohumeral joint. This is a synovial ball and socket joint between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus. So both articular surfaces of this joint are covered with hyaline cartilage. This is also surrounded by a fibrous capsule that is attached to, uh, superiorly to the margin of the glenoid cavity and inferiorly to the anatomic neck of the humerus. So the capsule is reinforced by the rotator cuff mainly and the glenohumeral ligament and also the coraco. Uh, humeral ligaments. Also, in this joint, we have a cavity that is deepened by a fibrocartilaginous glenoid labrum. So, what is this? The glenoid labrum communicates with the subscapular bursa and allows abduct adduction, adduction, flexion, and extension, and also circumduction and rotation. That joint is also innervated by three uh, nerves, the axillary, the suprascapular, and the lateral pectoral nerve. And also, the, uh, this joint receives blood from the branches of the suprascapular, anterior, and posterior humeral circumflex and scapular circumflex arteries. Uh, this joint may be subjected for dislocation if there is injury, uh, either inferior or anterior type of dislocation, which stretches the fibrous capsule, avulses the deep cavity or the glenoid labrum, and may injure the possible the axillary nerve. Next joint, please. I don't know. Uh, yeah, lang a slide. So, balik. Balik na slide, please. Previous slide, please. Thank you. So, for the rotator cuff muscle, uh, as I uh, told you a while ago that the rotator cuff uh, is involved in the reinforcement of the capsule. So, what is this rotator cuff? Uh, we also call this the muscular tendinous. So, what is this? So, this is the, uh, we call the pneumonic shift. Uh, so, it is the tendons of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, perispinal, and the subscapularis uh, tendon muscles. So uh, this fuses to the joint capsules and provides mobility and stability, and also keeps the head of the humerus in the clenoid fossa during movement, thus stabilizing the shoulder joint. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the ligaments of the shoulder joints are the glenohumeral ligament, the transverse humeral ligament, the coracohumeral ligament, the coracoacromial ligament, and also the coracoclavicular ligament. So the gleno glenohumeral ligament extends from the, uh, the, there are two types of glenohumeral ligament, the superior, I mean three types, the superior, the middle, and the inferior. So the superior is when this extends from the supraglenoid tubercle to the upper part of the lesser tubercle of the humerus. For the middle glenohumeral ligament, this extends from the super, supraglenoid tubercle to the upper, uh, to the uh, lower anatomic neck of the humerus. And for the inferior glenohumeral ligament, it is extending from the supraglenoid tubercle to the lower part of the lesser tubercle of the humerus. For the transverse humeral ligament, this extends between the greater and lesser tubercles and holds the tendon of the long head of the bicep in the intertubercular groove. The next ligament, the coracohumeral ligament, this extends from the coracoid process to the greater tubercle. 
The next ligament is the coracoacromial ligament. This extends to the coracoid process to the acromion. Lastly, the coracoclavicular ligament extends to the coracoid process to the clavicle and consists of the trapezoid and conoid ligament. Next slide, please. As I mentioned a while ago, there are bursas in the joint, shoulder, or the glenohumeral joint. So, what is the purpose of this bursa? So, this forms a lubricating mechanism between the trochaeal cuff and the coracoacromial arch during movement of the shoulder joint. So, there are three types of bursa. So, the subacromial bursa, subdentoid bursa, and the subscapular bursa. For the subacromial bursa, this lies between the coracoid acromial arch and the supraspinatus muscle. Usually communicating with the subdental bursa and protects the supraspinatus tendon against friction with the acromion bone. Also, uh, the subdental bursa lies between the deltoid muscle and the shoulder joint capsule. Usually communicate with the subacromial bursa and facilitates the movement of the deltoid muscle over the joint capsule and the supraspinatus tendon. Lastly, the subscapular bursa lies between the subscapularis tendon and the neck of the scapula and this communicates with the synovial cavity of the shoulder joint. Next slide, please. For the elbow joint, this forms a synovial hinge joint consisting of the humero, humero radial and the humero ulnar joint. And this allows flexion and extension and also uh, part of the joint is also the proximal radio ulnar joint, which is a pivot type of joint. And these, all three of those joints, the humero radial, humero ulnar, and proximal, proximal radio ulnar joint, uh, is within a common articular capsule. So, uh, the, liga, uh, the elbow joint is innervated by uh, four nerves, the musculocutaneous, medial, radial, and ulnar nerves. And also, the depressive blood from the anastomosis formed by the branches of the brachial artery and the current branches of the radial and ulnar artery. And this joint is also reinforced by three ligaments, the annular ligament, radial collateral ligament, and the ulnar uh, ligament. Next slide, please. For the, also another joint in the upper limb is the proximal radio ulnar joint. As I uh, mentioned a while ago, this is part of your elbow joint also. It is a contributing joint. So this is a pivot joint, synovial pivot joint, in which the head of the radius articulates with the radial nodes of the ulna and allows the movement of pronation and supination by permitting the head of the radius to rotate within the encircling annular ligament. Also, the next joint is the distal radio ulnar joint. This also forms a synovial pivot joint between the head of the ulna and the ulnar notch of the radius, which allows pronation and supination. Next slide, please. Next joint is the wrist joint, or we call it the radiocarpal joint. So, this is a synovial condylar joint formed superiorly by the radius and art the articular disc mm -hmm. and inferiorly by the proximal row of the carpal bone, specifically the scaphoid, lunate, and rarely the trichotrum. Uh, the capsule of this joint is strengthened by the radial and ulnar uh, collateral ligament and also along with the uh, dorsal and palmar radiocarpal ligament. The movement for this joint allows flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, and circumduction of the upper limb. Uh, the next joint is the mid-carpal joint. This forms a synovial chain joint between the proximal and distal rows of the carpal bone and allows sliding and sliding movement. Next slide, please. For the carpometacarpal joint, this is a synovial saddle joint or cellar joint. Uh, this is between the carpal bone, the trapezium specifically, and the first metacarpal bone, allowing flexion and extension movement, also abduction and adduction, and also circumduction. This also forms another type of joint, which is a plane joint between the carpal bone and the four medial metacarpal bones, allowing a simple gliding motion. Uh, also, second to the last joint in the upper limb is a meta, the metacarpophalyngeal joint. These are condyloid joints that allow flexion and extension, abduction and adduction. The last joint is the interphalyngeal joint 
is a uh, hinge type of joint that allows flexor and extension movement. Next slide, please. So, good morning once again. So, for the muscles of the arm, so the arm is divided into anterior and posterior compartments by extension of the deep fascia, which are called the medial and lateral intermuscular septa. So, the function of this uh, septa provide additional surface for the attachment of these muscles. We also form planes along which nerves and blood vessels uh, travel. So, and also, they are well defined only in the lower half of the arm and are attached to the medial and lateral borders and, su and supracondylar ridges of the, the humerus. So, the medial septum is pierced by the ulnar nerve and the superior ulnar collateral artery. Uh, however, for the lateral septum, used by the radial nerve and anterior descending branch of the profunda tracheal artery. Next slide, please. So, two additional septa are also present in the anterior compartment of the arm. So, these are the transverse and anterior posterior septums. And for the muscles involved on the anterior compartment of the arm, these are the biceps, coracobrachialis, and the brachialis. Next slide, please. So, the bicep brachii is a two-headed uh, muscle, although the majority of this muscle mass is located anteriorly to the humerus. Uh, it, it has no attachment to the bone itself. And uh, one of the functions of it is the supination of the forearm and also it flexes the arm of the elbow and at the shoulder of the, and also at the shoulder. So, the clinical relevance of these muscles are, uh, is the bicep reflex. So, bicep, re uh, bicep reflex is tested during physical examination by the tapping of the tendon of the bicep profile by reflex hammer with forearm turned and partially extended at the elbow. So, normally, the reflex will be brief like a uh, brief jerk like flexion of the elbow. So, the normal reflex confirms also the integrity of the musculoplatinous nerve and C5 and C6 spinal segments of our, of our body. Next slide, please. The next, the next muscle is the coracobrachialis. So, the coracobrachialis muscle lies due to the biceps structure of the arm. So, mainly it is originates from the coracoid process of the scapula and this muscle passes through the axilla and attaches to the medial side of the humeral shaft at the level of the deltoid protocol. So one of the one of its functions are uh, is flexion of the arm at the shoulder and hip adduction. Next slide. And for the brachialis, uh, the brachialis muscle lies deep to the bicep brachii also and is found more distally than the other muscles of the arm. So mainly it forms the floor of the cubital fossa. So the, this muscle originates from the medial and lateral surface of the humeral shaft and insert into the ulna tuberosity, just distal to the elbow joint. So what, one of the functions of it is the flexion of the elbow. So with regards for the innervation and blood supply of this muscle, they will be reported by my call in terms later on. Next slide. And for the muscles of the arm, so since the muscles of the arm is mainly uh, divided into anterior and posterior, for the posterior compartment muscles, the responsible muscles that uh, that we may locate on this part are the long head, uh, the triceps brachii. So when we say triceps brachii, from the word is that triceps, so mainly the, uh, there are three head of it. So the long, lateral, and med, uh, medial head of the triceps. Next slide, please. So, the triceps uh, brachii mainly it originates from the intraglenoid tubercle. So one of its one of its functions is the extension of the arm, uh, extension of the arm at the elbow. So uh, mainly they, uh, they, uh, they have three heads. So the, the lateral heads originate from the humerus superior to the radial lobe, and the medial head originates from the humerus inferior to the radial uh, lobe. So basically, the head converts into the one tendon and certainly and insert into the olecranon of the ulna. 
next slide so the uh, la, uh, the muscle uh, the last muscle of the uh, arm is the unconscious so unconscious uh, unconscious is connects the medial aspect of the ulna to the lateral aspect of the humerus and it is a short triangular elbow of the muscles so it is officially classified as branch of the tricep rotary muscles due to its location and functionality so uh, it i have it arises from the lateral inflation of the humerus and has a wide attachment within the posterior lateral surface of the elbow of the electron so mainly the function of it is mainly to allow the person to extend his elbow and rotate the forearm so uh, this action is to carry something as a food server so food server will be next slide so in summary uh, so when we talk about muscle so we are, we are quite familiar of the abbreviation IONA, so the insertion, origin, nerve, and action. So the, the so for the blood and innervation, we will be discussed for my day a little on. Next slide. So the muscles of the forearm, so same, the muscle, the forearm is divided into anterior and posterior compartments. Both are, both are separated by, uh, lateral intermuscular septum, enterosis membrane, and attachment of the deep fascia along the posterior border of the ulna. Next slide. So, muscles in the anterior flexor compartment of the forearm are mainly composed of three layers. So, these are superficial, intermediate, and deep. So, generally, these muscles, these muscles are associated with the movements of the wrist, flexion of the finger, uh, fingers, and also for me, for me, so that's like this. So when we say since we, since we are mainly composed of three layers, so these are intermediate and deep uh, layers, so the five muscles of the superficial group uh, pro process the elbow joint, so uh, these are the pronator teres, flexor calcaradialis, palmaris lungus, flexor digitorum spontacialis, and flexor calci palmaris. And for the pronator teres, uh, uh, it is inserted into the middle of the radius. For the flexor calcaradialis, uh, they are responsible for the index finger and for the palma, uh, palmaris longus, the ring finger, flexor digitorum superficialis, the middle finger, and lastly, it's the flexor carpionaris, uh, which is uh, responsible for the little finger. And for the deep muscles involved, these are the flexor pollicis longus, flexor digitorum profundus, and lastly, it's the pronator quadratus. And for the for the intermediate layer of uh, of the anterior compartment of the forearm, only one are involved in it, which is the flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, they are both uh, superficial and intermediate. As like this. And for the posterior muscles of the forearm, so uh, for the superficial muscles, these are the greater radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum superficialis, extensor digitinumi, and extensor carpi uh, ulnare. So mainly, uh, these muscles are associated with movement of the wrist joint, extension of the fingers and thumb, and also supine motion. And and these are uh, the, the superficial muscles of the back of the forearm are mainly from these uh, uh, type of muscles that, uh, discussed, that I discussed. And for the deep muscles, uh, these are the supernator, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor pollicis longus, and last is extensor indices. And for the this uh this uh back of the four uh posterior part of the four uh, muscles are mainly uh 
more uh, the group as into lateral group and posterior group or superficial extensor. So for the lateral group, these are the brachial radialis extensor, parti radialis longus, extensor, parti radialis brevis. And for the posterior group, these are the extensor digitorum, extensor digitinimini, and lastly the extensor parti ulnaris. Next slide. So this this is the illustration of the posterior muscles of the forearm. Next slide. And the summary. So next, thank you. So for the muscle of the hand, um, the the muscle of the hand is subdivided into senor and hyposenor. For the senor, um. We have your opponent's polysis. Its main action is it opposes the thumb to the other digits and it is innervated by the recurrent branch of your median nerve. The next one is your abductor polysis brevis. Its main action is it abducts the thumb and it is innervated by the recurrent branch of your median nerve. The third one is your flexor polysis brevis, which flexes the thumb and it is innervated by the recurrent branch of your median nerve. The last one is your ab adductor pollicis brevis, which, ab which adducts the thumb and it is innervated by the branch of the ulnar nerve. For the hypotenar muscle, it is um, composed of your abductor digiti minimi, which abducts the little finger and its nerve innervation is the deep branch of your ulnar nerve. The second one is your flexor digiti minimi brevis, its action is it flexes the digital phalanx of the little finger and it is innervated by the deep branch of your ulnar nerve. And um, the opponent's digiti um, which opposes the little finger and it is innervated by your deep branch of your ulnar nerve. Then the last one is your palmaris brevis which wrinkles the skin on the medial side of the palm and it is innervated by the deep branch of your ulnar nerve. Next slide, please. Then for the short muscles, it is composed of your lumbricals. Its action is it flexes the metacarpophalangeal joints, extend the interphalangeal joints of the second to fifth digits, and it is innervated by the median nerve. Then the dorsal interossei, its action is it abducts the second to fourth digits from axial line, and act with the lumbricals in flexing the carpophalangeal joint and extending the interphalangeal joint. And it is innervated by your deep branch of your ulnar nerve. And the last one is your palmar interossei. Uh, its action is it adapts the second, the fourth, and the fifth digit. And it flexes the metacarpophalangeal joint and extend the interphalangeal joint. And it is innervated by the deep branch of your ulnar nerve. Next slide. So this table shows the summary of the origin, the insertion, the nerve, the nerve innervation, and the action of your of the muscles of the hand. Next slide. So moving on to the nerve supply of the arm and the forearm. Number one, we have your musculocutaneous nerve, which is inner, um, which innervates the three muscles: coracobrachialis, biceps and brachialis and all these are all flexor muscles in the anterior compartment its motor motor function includes flexion of the arm at the elbow supination of the forearm sensory uh, um, it trans continues into the forearm as the lat as the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve so um to, to correlate it clinically injury of the muscle results in weakness of the supinator which um supine of your supination with in your biceps and flexion in your biceps and your brachialis of forearm and loss of sensation on the lateral side of your forearm. For the median nerve, this is innervates the flexor carpi radialis, your palmaris lungus, your pronator quadratus, your pronator teres, and digital flexors. Motor function includes thumb flexion and opposition flexion of digits two and three, wrist flexion abdu and abduction and forearm coordination. Its um, sensory function um, is, uh, includes the skin over the anterolateral surface of the hand. Um, so injury of this 
may co- is usually caused by your supracondylar fracture of the humerus and compression of the carpal tunnel. For the radial nerve, this usually enerva- uh, this enervates the triceps, extensor carpi radialis, and ulnaris, supinator, and extensor pollicis. The motor function includes extension of all arm, wrist, and proximal finger joints below the shoulder, forearm supination, thumb abduction in place of thumb. Sensory function includes those in your posterior arm and forearm below the fingertips of the medial three and one half of the fingers. Wherein um, also this um, your radial nerve also further divides into your deep branch and your superficial branch. Branch your deep branch enters the supinator muscle and supplies the extensor carpi radialis brevis and supinator muscles. The superfi- superficial branches descends into the forearm under the cover of the brachial radialis muscle and runs distally to the dorsum of the hand to innervate the skin of the radial side of the hand and the radial two and one half digits over the proximal phalanx. Injury for a while. So injury of this, uh, injury of your radial nerve is usually caused by your fracture, by a fracture of the body of the humerus. Um, also compression of the nerve in the axilla and also can be due to using improperly adjusted patches which can result in what we call as your wrist drop. Lastly is the ulnar nerve, which enervates the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum profundus, adductor pollicis, small digital muscles, and fu- which functions as finger ab- adduction and abduction over the thumb, thumb adduction, flexion of the digits four and five, and flexion and wrist flexion and adduction. Sensory, it, it supplies your skin over the medial surface of the hand through the superficial branches. So your nerve, your ulnar nerve is also divide, um, continuous with your uh, superficial and deep branches. The superficial branches innervate the palmaris brevis and skin over the palmar and dorsal surface of the medial one third of the hand while your deep branches enervate the hypothenar muscles, the medial two lumbricals, all the inter and adductor policies, and usually the deep head of the flexor. Commonly, um, I, your ulnar nerve is usually, injury of this nerve is usually caused by a fracture of the medial epicondyle, and which results in a claw hand and can further um, um, result in the loss of abduction and adduction of the fingers and flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints. So next is for the blood supply of the upper limb. Next is. Uh, first is we have the bunch of the subclavia artery, which is a subclavia artery. Which is a branch of your thyroid cervical trunk, supplies the synapses and the synapses muscles, and also the shoulder and your acromioclavicular joint. Next is you have your dorsal scapular or your descending scapular artery, which arises from your subclavian artery, and supplies the levator scapulae, rhomboids, and your synapses anterior muscles. Next is Next is you have your axillary artery, uh, which extends from the outer border of your first period to the interior border of your thyroid major muscle. So for the branches of your axillary artery, you have your superior or supreme thoracic artery, which supplies the intercostal muscles in the first and second anterior intercostal spaces and adjacent muscles. Next is you have your thracoacromial artery, which pierces the Postoperatory membrane or your SWE, lateral fascia. Next is your lateral thoracic artery, which runs around the lateral border of your pectoralis minor muscle and supplies the pectoralis major and minor as well as the thoracic anterior muscle. Another branch is the subscapular artery, which 
also rented out uh, as your Trapo Delta entry with the company's user. Trapo Delta nerve and supplies the electric the pretty much dirty muscle and your lateral traffic wall. Another band is the circumflex capillary artery which passes particularly into the connect space. Another uh, band of the axillary artery is the anterior humeral circumflex artery which passes anteriorly around the surgical neck of the humeral. Next is you have the posterior humeral circumflex artery which runs posteriorly with the axillary nerve through the quadrangular space. Uh, next is we have the brachial artery which lies on the side of brachii and then on the brachialis muscle we go to the brachobrachialis and bicep brachii. The branches for the brachial artery are the profunda brachii or the deep brachial artery which depends posteriorly with the radial nerve and divides into the middle collateral artery and the radial collateral artery. Another branch is the superior ulnar collateral artery which pierces the middle intermuscular Pillar, the plume, and, uh, and accompanies the ulnar nerve. The inferior ulnar collateral artery arises just above the elbow and descends in front of the middle of the nerve. For the radial artery, uh, this arises from the radial artery in the cubital costa and descends laterally under cover of the back. Here is your radialis muscle. Uh, for the branches, we have your radial decline artery, which are not smoothed with the radial collateral branch or the profunda brachii artery. Your palmar carpal branch, which joins the palmar carpal branch of the ulnar artery and forms the palmar carpal arch. The superficial palmar branch, which passes through the central muscle and anastomosis with the superficial branch of the ulnar artery to complete the superficial palmar arterial arch. And that's the dorsal carpal branch, which joins the dorsal carpal branch of the ulnar artery and the dorsal terminal branch of the anterior interosseous artery to form the dorsal carpal branch. Another branch is your uh, princess polyphic artery, which descends along the ulnar border of the first metacarpal bone under the flexor polyphic longus tendon and divides into prop two proper digital arteries which supplies their thumb. Uh, the radialis conducive artery arises from the deep palmar arch or the princess conducive artery. The deep palmar arch uh, also gives rise to three palmar metacarpal arteries. Next, please. For the ulnar artery, uh, this is the larger major branch of the brachial artery uh, and also descends behind the ulnar head of the pinnated thyrus muscle and lies between the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus muscle. Uh, the, uh, the branches of the ulnar artery are the anterior ulnar recurrent artery with anastomosis with the anterior ulnar collateral artery. The posterior ulnar recurrent artery is anastomosis with the superior ulnar collateral artery. The common interosseous artery is arises from the lateral side of the ulnar artery and branches out into anterior and posterior interosseous artery. The palmar uh, carpal branch uh, forms the palmar carpal arch together with the palmar carpal branch of the radial artery. And the dorsal carpal branch of the ulnar artery passes around the ulnar side of the wrist and joins the dorsal carpal reef. The superficial palmar arterial part lies immediately under the palmar aponeurosis and gives rise to three common palmar digital arteries. And the deep palmar branch gives rise to the palmar metacarpal artery that joins the common uh, palmar digital artery. Okay. For the venous drainage of the upper limb, you have your deep and superficial venous arches, which formed by a pair of drainage comitantes, which accompany each of the deep and superficial parma arterial arches, as well as the deep vein of the arm and the forearm, which follow the course of your arteries as we really, really, really start. 
as well as how you actually have been with this is the crack one to just fix things and provide collateral circulation. Yes, please. We also have just a superficial gain from the upper limb. First, we have the cephalic gain. It begins as a result of continuation of the dorsal venous network and runs on the lateral side and connected with the bacillus gain by the medial cubital gain. Next is we have the bacillus gain, which arises from the dorsal venous part of the hand and accompanies the medial contemporary of the venous nerve. We also have the medial cubital gain. So like the cephalic bone to the bacillus bone over the cubital muscle. Next is we have the medial antibacterial vein with extension on the front of the forearm and then the medial cubital or bacillus vein. And last is the dorsal venous network which is formed by the dorsal metaphorical vein. Next is the So uh, let's start off with the um, epidemiology. So um, the carpal and phalangeal fractures are common and um, more than 50% of these are um, work-related. So um, the most common location is, is your uh, P3 or your distal phalanx. And then um, the next is the metacarpal and then the P1. And then um, uh, your most problematic is your P2 in the middle. So for anatomy and pathology, so your metacarpal is um, bowed concave on the palmar surface. And then um, your phalanx is named um, as P1, P2, P3. So um, we have um, deforming forces that um, usually um, deform your proximal and distal segment in a um, more or less predictable na pattern. So your P1, the first na um, Phalanx, phalanx uh, would be uh, um, deformed into apex polar na, um, na habitus and then um, for your P2 it's usually unpredictable and your um, uh, it? so um, it's more common in male and um, in, by age group so for um, 30 years old na patient it's more commonly associated um, sports where well, for 50 years old it's um, associated with um, work. So injury mechanism, so it's usually caused by mga extra loading such as ball sports or mga bending forces. Uh, it could also be due to torsional mechanisms such as uh, getting caught sa clothes and then crushing injuries such as work-related injury and um, Usually, this um, the factors and dislocations of the hand is also um, usually associated with um, injuries in the carpus, or um, elbow, and even up to the shoulder girdle. That's why uh, we also in uh, emergency room we also take um, X-rays at um, mga joints above or more proximal to his to, to the hand. <coughs> So associated injuries includes uh, open injuries, uh, tendon injuries, nerve and vessels, and um, the combination of all. And uh, so for the clinical evaluation, uh, it's important to know uh, the age, and also, also the hand dominance, uh, the occupation of the patient to know if um, um, uh, pinangan ba niya gamitan niya hand, and then uh, important ba for um, functioning yung hand affected and then um, for systemic illnesses then the mechanism of injury the time of injury and uh, the initial treatment provided so for the physical exam it's also important to assess the variability such as your perfusion time and then uh, for neurologic neurologic status it's important to um, um, assess uh, two-point discrimination um, it's normally baka uh, maka differentiate ang human hand uh, 2 to 5 millimeters uh, or less than 6 millimeters uh, uh, distance between two points. And then also, it's important to uh, assess the motor uh, function. <clears throat> so, your, um, your rotational alignment could also be viewed 
by uh, asking the patient to flex the um, the the PIP and the MCP joint. So it's usually if um, there's a rotational uh, malalignment, this uh, is parallel. So signs and symptoms include pain, swelling, and stiffness, uh, deformity, and also loss of co coordination. So for the imaging studies, so this includes your radiograph, so at least two projections, your PA and your lateral, but also you could uh, request a third oblique, so usually we order a hand apple, so AP oblique lateral. Uh, to reveal um, this placement not evident in your PA and lateral views. For CT scan, um, it's important for pre-op planning, especially in complex periarticular fractures, such as um, pillion fractures at the base of the P2, because um, it requires um, more as an anatomic reduction. And also for mga radio-opaque foreign bodies, so ultrasound uh, is used to detect radiolos and foreign bodies not detected in your um, CT scan. And your MRI as pack up for uh, um, uh, foreign bodies. So for the classification, so your hand injuries are classified into open versus closed. I will discuss later why. And then um, for the bone location involved, so if it is the metacarpal, the, the phalanx, and then which part is it the head, the neck, the shaft, the base. And then the configuration is, is the transverse, the spiral. So basically it's more or less the same with any other bones. And then um, the displacement, the dislocation, is it the dorsal volar or um, dislocated rotator really? And is it articular or interarticular? And is it stable or unstable? So for the classification, so it, if it is open, so it is uh, important not to probe the injury in the emergency room because uh, this may only drive um, surface contaminants deeper into the wound. So we usually, in the ER, we usually do um, just irrigation. <clears throat> and then um, the need of your prophylactic antibiotics is um, controversial, but um, for bite wounds, we uh, it is uh, highly recommended uh, to do an aggressive and early surgical debridement and antibiotics. Um, especially um, in human human bite or uh, animal bite. So uh, for the bite wounds, we usually um, cover for uh, polymicrobial. So we, we use a broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, that also have with anaerobic na coverage. So uh, we also have a classification of um, a wound. This is called the Swanson Sabo Anderson classification, wound of hunting. Um, it is uh, more or less protective of your infection. So your type one wound. These are. Um, wounds that uh, that are clean uh, with minimal contamination or delay in treatment, and also patient diagnosis systemic illness. So, um, so um, your um, type two is um, if there are one or more of, um, of these criteria, so there's significant contamination. Um, such as uh, farm injury, pioneer injury, or uh, injury uh, that occurred in the river. And then um, if there is delay in treatment more than 24 hours and sig significant uh, systemic illness, such as uh, DM, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, and even hepatitis and asthma. So um, for type 1, um, primary internal fixation or uh, immediate wood closure is recommended while well, your type 2 um, primary internal fixation could be done uh, but um, delayed closure um, is um, recommended and it's still um, it's more or less uh, contaminated <coughs> so um, here um, for the um, for the general principles for the fight bite injuries of the human bites so um, Usually, these injuries happens in uh, intoxicated you know, patients, so that's why um, you cannot really assess 
the um the what happened yeah, sa injury so um but in physical exam if you if you see a curve laceration overlying a joint in mcp joint so um it's presumable na it, it's caused by a tooth so it's usually per, the um the microbial isolate is usually polymicrobial <coughs> and, and aerobic the most common isolate of this um, fight bite injuries or you know, human bites is your streptococcus and genosus so we we uh, give both spectrum antibiotics irrigation and um, debridement for your animal bites uh, um, the most common isolate is your pasturella and your echinella so um what um, what is recommended is to give an ampisol and also other um, meds you could use is your uh, sifoxetin or itapinim and then um, your plinga so um, for treatment op- options for the hand injuries uh, we have uh, immediate motion you could do a temporary sprinting you could do a close reduction and internally fix the injury and then um, open reduction internal fixation and or immediate uh, reconstruction so um, in general your non-operative treatment um, has an advantage of being um, lower in our cost and lower complications such as bleeding infection but your um, stability is um, less assured or well, your close reduction internal fixation so it prevents overt deformity, but uh, it's not so anatomic. Um, it's also prone to your uh, to pin track infection. So, what's more anatomic is your um, open reduction internal fixation. But um, the advan- disadvantage of this is um, there's more tissue trauma. So, um. Um, for rotational alignment, by the way, um, as indication for non-op versus operative na management. So, um, I mean for the stability. Day. For the stability, uh, your your stability is defined as a loss of reduction um, when joint is moved at 30 percent of its normal function. So it's usually indicated to the to do a uh, um, um, fixation, surgical fixation. So indications for your surgical intervention includes uh, open fracture and then unstable fractures as what is defined earlier, um, irreducible fractures, multiple fractures, bone loss, and associated uh, tendon lacerations. So um, in hand injuries, it is important to start uh, motion on the joints that are stable enough or mga uninjured na areas um, to rehabilitate within 72 hours because um, at this time uh, there's already start of a soft tissue contraction and um, this is um, detrimental especially in your hand because your hand is dextrous so um for the treatment of stable fractures, so um, we could uh, apply a body taping or sprinting and then um, repeat uh, X-ray in after one week. Um, and um, for the treatment of unstable fractures, so internal fixation for unstable and um, irreducible fractures are um, done. <clears throat> for the treatment in um, fracture with segmental bone loss, so it is uh, usually directed to the associated soft tissue injury and also to achieve and maintain a length. So for the specific fracture pattern, so before that we first discussed the specific parts. So this is your carpal bones, which is uh, already discussed. Um, so um, the coverage of this discussion is your um, the metacarpal bones, which has your head, your neck, and body, and the face. Then your your phalanges, one, P1, P2, P3, which also had a head, body, and a base. So they are um, numbered as one, two, three, four, five. Uh, starting with your thumb as number one. 
then index, middle, ring, and the small finger. So um, let's start with the metacarpal. So um, for the fractures in the head, so it's usually require an anatomic reduction. So it is printed in protected position, this one here. So your MCP joint uh, is flexed at 70 degrees and raised at 30 degrees. And then um, for a displaced uh, metacarpal head, it usually requires uh, fixation. So for the neck, um, neck fractures usually caused by direct trauma, and um, um, it is usually your metacarpal is usually um, deformed into dorsal apex angulation. So this is your just maneuver, by the way. So um, it is done by um, applying an uh, actual force through a flex MCP and um, PIP joint. So you apply an actual force on your first uh, phalanx and then uh, counter traction on, this, um, on the metacarpal to, re to facilitate reduction of this fracture. <coughs> For the shaft, uh, we apply a, a splinting and then although your third and fourth um, metacarpal um, is uh, relatively stable due to the inter uh, metacarpal na ligament. So um, for the shaft, acceptable na, um, degrees of angulation is it should be less than 10 degrees. Um, for the fourth and fifth, uh, it um, should be less than 20 degrees angulation. <coughs> And also, um, your mirror rotation should not be more than 10 degrees because um, a 10 degrees uh, mirror rotation would cause a greater than 2 cm overlap. So, um, we have shown it here. So, if rotated in the carpal, it causes a, an overlap. <laughs> so, the carpal is. Uh, So your fingers is uh, usually associated uh, carpal metacarpal fracture dislocations because of the proximity. So I will be discussing later your um, your the fracture of the first uh, metacarpal. So this includes your um, Bennett and your uh, Rolando, and um, I will discuss the difference. We also have a reverse Bennett. So these are the uh, Im images of your um, um, Bennett and Rolando. So your your Bennett is a partial articular uh, fracture on the base of the first meta metacarpal. Well, your Rolando is a complete articular. So it's um, could be further classified into a T or a Y fracture. Um, this. Uh, so um, the deforming forces of this is that the abductor pollicis and adductor pollicis causes uh, flexion and supination and proximal migration. So um, these are um, relatively unstable uh, fractures that requires fixation. For the proximal and middle phalanx, so um, it could be classified into intraarticular and extraarticular. So um, for the condylar fractures, it usually requires uh, anatomic reduction. <coughs> and, um, while your comminuted and intraarticular, comminuted, severely comminuted intraarticular fractures requires reconstruction. Um, if not reconstructable, then um, early protected mobilization is um, applied. So um, for um, PAP fractures in this location, so uh, the fracture in your vol volar lip um, if uh, if less than 30 to 50 percent lang na articulars, uh, um, we could do a, a block splint, and you body splint it with um, um, with the adjacent na finger for up to three weeks um, at 20 degrees uh, yeah, position, and then for greater than 40 percent articular, so you use an um, dynamic na external fixator. Okay. So for dorsal lip fracture, um, it's usually um, associated with a central slip avulsion. 
So if less than 1 mm displacement lang, you do a sprinting. For greater 1 mm displacement, you do a um, Wooler's. It's, uh, uh, it's usually uh, an indication for operation. For extra articular fractures of their um, proximal and middle phalanx. Um, so it fractures in your shaft, the deforming forces that acts on your um, um, phalanx is, um, I, I mean, the, the, the habitus of the bone uh, depends on the location of the fracture. So it's, if it's near the neck, um, your, your, your bone is, um, is um, an apex volar in a position where well, um, if it's near the base, it's in a dorsal apex and could be your central state. <coughs> <Okay. laughs> For the distal phalanx, so, um, it will also be classified into intraarticular and extraarticular fractures. Uh, for the dorsal lip, uh, it's so called a mallet finger, so your mallet finger could also be. Uh, purely tin tendinous or um, with associated uh, bony um, avulsion. So um, some recommend a non-operative uh, management for this one by doing a full-time extension sprinting for um, six to eight weeks, while others recommend a, a close reduction internal fixation. For the uh, extra articular fracture, so um, you could do a close reduction in sprinting. And um, it is important to, um, um, true to all, uh, true to all joints, it is important to immobilize the um, only the joint na, um, that causes instability. So for this one, uh, you only mobilize the PIP joint and to leave the DIP and the other joints um, free to prevent contracture. So you apply a close reduction internal fixation in a widely displaced fracture. The carpometacarpal joint dislocation um, is usually due to a high energy na, um, um, mechanism of injury. So uh, this, um, this is best viewed in um, X-ray in 30 degrees uh, pronated view. So dorsal fracture dislocations, uh, post reduction internal fixation um, versus ORIF is the treatment of choice. For um, MCP joint dislocation, so um, dorsal dis dislocation, as shown here, is the most is the most common. And um, in in hyperextension posture, and, and it's usually um, reduced by a uh, flexion of the joint and uh, with gen gentle traction and also you could apply a flexion, uh, partial flexion on your wrist to facilitate the reduction to relax, to relax the flexor tendon. <coughs> uh, for the thumb um, metacarpophalangeal joint dislocation, so important to discuss here is your st stainer lesion. So your stainer lesion um, is um, when your um, ulnar collateral ligament is um, interposed in your adductor which is na upon your rosis. So it is interposed dorsally. So the implication for this one is that um, it causes delay in healing so it, um, which could affect the function of your um, thumb. Thus requires um, um, surgery. So for the non-operative, we apply in an, a, a thumb spica. And for the operative, um, indications uh, includes uh, MC, if MC, your MCP joint opens greater than 30 degrees or um, 50, more than 15 degrees from the contralateral side. For PIP joint dislocation, so um, it's usually high rate uh, um, for misdiagnosis. <coughs> and also uh, assessed and uh, congruence is assessed on uh, lateral radiographs to detect subluxation. So it's classified into a dorsal, volar, rotatory dislocations. 
um, and a pulse reduction and then active range of motion with adjacent digit strapping is uh, applied. So um, your proxima interphalangeal joint is extended for four to six weeks. And while well, chronic cases requires an open reduction. So um, same general principle, only the joint uh, uh, of interest um, we immobilize. For DIP and um, thumb na interphalangeal joint dislocations, it's usually diagnosed late, um, and thus uh, usually chronic after three weeks. Um, for dorsal dislocations, acute, uh, it must be immobilized at 20 degrees flexion for three weeks. <clears throat> for operative, um, we do operative to resect scar tissue in chronic cases and also to allow attention free reduction. So the use of PYs is based on stability and not generally indicated in all open uh, dislocation. So for the complications of, um, of hand injuries, so um, your malunion uh, angulation can result in the prominence of the MCP heads. So in the second and third um, met metacarpal, uh, rotational and angulatory um, malunion causes cosmetic and functional disturbance. Your non-union is um, usually uncommon, but um, common in um, hand injuries that has um, extensive soft tissue injuries, uh, bone loss, and uh, grossly infected. For <clears throat> infection, it requires a meticulous debridement and appropriate antibiotics. MCP joint extension contracture is uh, usually due to splinting. That's why it, um, it is um, important to 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 position to properly position the itong, um, protective na splint, itong intrinsic plus. <clears throat> For the loss of motion, um, uh, this is usually due to tendon interference. For post-traumatic osteoarthritis, uh, this is due to failure to achieve anatomic reduction in articulating surfaces due to other bones. So these are the opinions that I have collected. So your Lando is partial particular, your Bennett complete particular, your reverse Bennett and your the fifth meta uh, carpal, your boxers and your fifth neck, uh, and then um, the mallet and the Seymour fracture. That's it. Thank you. I'm Sam. Um, did you include the uh, radiographic views for, for the hand in terms of diagnosing? Um, like for your metacarpal like head, for example, um, what do you the, take? Um, for the thumb, uh, are you talking about the uh, the land of view? So, uh, the, the Robert's view, right? Yeah, what about for the um, metacarpal head fracture? Uh, I wasn't able to include that kind of the radio prop, the radio prop. Yeah, I have specific one on that you do it on your view, so you go through long ballet time. Yeah, it's If I let you do the endorsement. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, doctors, uh, fellow residents, uh, interns. So, for the past 24 hours, the, the residents on duty, uh, Dr. D and you. So, we have a total of three admissions, uh, two co management, two consults, a total census of 163, total surgery seven, four for emergency, and three for elective. 
uh, there are three discharge patients, then uh, five COVID, COVID positive patients. For our first um, admission, patient CN, 17 year old male, uh, came in due to right elbow pain. Uh, patient had an MVA last um, June 16 at 10 p.m. at Tabunok, Cebu. So patient was riding a motorcycle, intoxicated when suddenly lost balance due to uh, speeding, just crashed on the gutter landing on his right side. Patient brought a, a local hospital and subsequently referred to our institution for further management. For the past medical history, um, so patient is student, uh, no comorbidities, no food nor drug allergies. With previous hospi hospitalization last uh, 2018 due to dengue fever and no prior surgeries. For the physical exam, uh, patient awake, alert, coherent, not in respiratory distress, with abrasion and laceration at the left submandibular area and a lacerated wound at right forearm. Also, a deformity and swelling of the right elbow with limited range of motion, uh, no wrist nor snuff box tenderness, no sensory motor deficit, with strong peripheral pulses and a CRT of less than two seconds. So these are the gross images of the patient. Um, noted uh, abrasions at the at the medial, you know, at the anterior part of the proximal um, forearm, and also swelling of your elbow, swelling and deformity. For the radiographs, uh, these are your uh, APL view of your uh, humerus or arms. So we noted a um, olecranon, olecranon fracture, which is uh, volarly displaced. And here your um, your forearm view and your elbow APL. So, also the the radial head is uh, volarly uh, displaced together with your olecranon olecranon fracture. So for our assessment, uh, fracture, open one complete, um, oblique olecranon right, uh, Mayo type three A, AO two U one B one. For the plan, uh, for formal development of wound. Uh, open reduction internal fixation plating electron and right then pending pump post reduction x-rays and ct scan sorry How did you apply the spin? Uh, we first reduced the elbow dock, so we um, did a traction, then, uh, then flex the elbow to about uh, 70 to 90 degrees. Then we applied a uh, long arm posterior splint. Not posterior. Can you go back to your x rays? Here you go. What x ray is that? Uh, this is your um, APL of your um, arm dock. So your injury is in the. In the elbow. So where is your elbow x ray now? This uh, X-rays were taken outside the uh, sa, sa previous hospital. So, so is your X-ray in our hospital? Napa repeat X-ray pa medok. When did the patient arrive? Uh, uh, Pagka gabi na dok. Uh, Kala lang i-check basi na na. Actually, ito ganyan, walang naman ako ba, Dok?
So what's your other X-ray? Your doc X-ray of the uh, forearm APL. So how would you diagnose a patient with those X-rays? Sorry, Doc. Uh, I'm going to check ang kanang x-rays sa uh, atang kanang hospital, Doc. For our next admission, patient R A, thirty five year old male. Is your elbow dislocated? Ah uh, yes, doc. So why is your diagnosis just an open type one olecranon? And are you sure it's an olecranon fracture? Ah, uh, nag consider pa minok na possible olecranon fracture, doc. So that's the thing. The patient came in last night. No one even followed up your x-rays uh, you're just satisfied with this x-rays uh, 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 the x-rays of the patient but in the uh, oblique structure of the uh, trans oblique structure what what uh, oblique structure uh, uh, proximal to the coronary bit of the electron and then it's uh, uh where, did yeah. you see, where did you see that which x-ray uh, uh, for this case sir we was um uh, the portable x-rays were taken for this case, but then they're still trying to diagnose it why it wasn't uploaded to uh, the What? What? Can you uh, speak clearly? Uh, portable x-rays were taken this around dawn, sir, and then we're still trying to up, uh, diagnose why it, it still wasn't uploaded to the sir. But you've seen the x-rays. Yes, I know. Why uh, didn't you just take a picture? Yes, uh, no, it was on, uh, on my card. So I, should, I should have taken a picture in each of you. Uh, I, thought, I thought it would be... But x-rays are directly. important, right? You're presenting this as pre-op. I know there, there, there is a disruption of the olecranon, <laughs> but this is not the proper x-ray to show that. Yes, uh, we were able to take uh, arm elbow and for arm x uh, So there's there's an X-ray. Why that? Why why is your junior don't know that there's an X-ray taken? I don't know what you're saying. Huh? Mm -hmm. All he did, all he answered was the you requested, but there's no X-ray yet. He doesn't know if it's taken or not. You're in the same yeah. duty, right? Uh, I don't know if it was, it was not uploaded. But we, we, we thought it would be uh, uploaded right away after, right after the extension. Yeah, but even if it's not uploaded, since you know that you're going to present this for, for endorsement, x-rays is the most important thing. <clears throat> that you're gonna put extra and gross pictures, the right? because mm -hmm. so that there's that much questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I to take a picture so, so Dr. Yu, um, why is your diagnosis only a fracture of the olecranon? I will update the uh, diagnosis, Dr. Yu. Now, we're always updating, diva. Right? When you're presenting, it should be checked. Your presentation should be checked. You know what you're writing there, so it should be it should be the correct one. Let's not just because this is an endorsement, we'll just keep on updating and updating, right? 
Yes, no. Because you already said you did close reduction, so you're sure that you're there is this location. Why well, is not that in your diagnosis? Isn't that an important thing? Oh, it's important, so What are your maneuvers in close reduction of the elbow? Uh, Learning issue again. Sige, learning issue. You you read and report on the maneuvers of elbow close reduction, huh? Yes, no, yes. And next time, mm -hmm. it should be once what you present here should be proper and complete. Let's not keep on updating because you you're not presenting thirty patients. You're just presenting. At most eight patients, probably, diba? Yes, no. And you're not seeing a lot of patients, pa? so there's no reason that you can't make this proper and and correct your presentations. Because there are what? How many of you are on duty? Five? Four? <clears throat> diba? Even if you're making it, it should be checked before you present it at 8 a.m. Nice, no. So what are what are your management for this patient? Uh, for um, open reduction internal fixation, of plating of the electron and loop. Then um, also for for the development of the wound. So what is your current management now? What is what what have you done to the patient? Uh, we applied a, a long arm posterior splint loop. What else? And um, uh, the secure number with uh, an arm sling. What else? So, uh, for uh, medications, antibiotics were started up. And, uh, what antibiotics? Uh, Sephir and clindamycin. Look. Why did you give clindamycin? Uh, clindamycin. Look. Why did you give clindamycin? Uh, to cover for also gram negative uh, bacteria. Is that the recommended management for an open type 1 fracture? Uh, no, no, for open type 1, only the cephalosporin. So, why did you give equindamycin? Since your diagnosis is just an open type 1. So you find out. <clears throat> so what else? What other management are you doing? Um, PTTIG were given a doc. Then why? Uh, okay, na siya wound then. Uh, wala pa siya ka receive of um, PTTIG say mga more than five to ten years wala na doc. Okay, what else? Other medications? Ah, pain reliever, sorry. Uh, PO lang uh, selicoxib, 400 milligram once a day. Um, and we can, yeah. okay, why, why did you plan on oriflating olecranon right? <clears throat> why not just tension band wiring? Sure, so that's it. That was, it's a fracture dislocation. I believe our tension band wire construct would be able to uh, hold the, uh, the electron in place with uh, the proximal fragment. Also, what's your reason? Because uh, it's a fracture dislocation, you cannot do a tension band wiring? The construct wouldn't be as stable compared to a. Uh, Why? What's the difference uh, of a plate between? Between a plate and a tension band wire, would it depend on the, the if it's dislocated or not to make it stable? Uh, one of the contraindications for tension band wiring is structural dislocation of the electron. Are you sure about that? Yeah. 
Ha? Can you show a paper on that? Or where, what's your source on that matter? That it's, it, it is contraindicated to do a tension band wire on a fracture dislocation of the fracture dislocation of the elbow. I will have to review it. It's quite very nice to listen. You have to show something if you're saying that because I haven't read that. Because all I know is you base your management on the fracture configuration. Yeah. Whatever fixation you're gonna use to on the olecranon process, as long as the fracture configuration is deemed to be treated as such and makes the elbow stable, it will be it will suffice. It doesn't have to be a plate or a K wire or whatever. What if it's just a fracture dislocation with a transverse fracture of your early cranon? Do you really need to plate that? Because, as you've said, it's a contraindication on for tension band wiring. Um, I think I will have to review my sources. Yeah, you have to re review and whatever you say, you make sure that it's correct or you have basis of such. Yeah, so you add your diagnosis here, huh? And try to get proper x-rays first before you even plan on what to do to this patient. Right now, is <coughs> you follow up the x-rays and make sure you have x-rays because if you've seen the x-ray as a senior, when you see it and when you see it there on the sh on the screen, just take pictures because you're you know that uploading the pictures would take a long time. So that during the presentation your your pictures of the X-ray are complete. You don't have to base everything because he's the junior. He should get everything, right? You can just he's making the slides. Then you can just add whatever is lacking because you should be the one to check these slides before it is presented in the morning. Okay, this should not happen again. Okay, next. Uh, next for our uh, next admission. So, patient R, a 35 year old male, uh, came in due to right, uh, right leg pain. So, for the reserve present illness, uh, patient had an MVA uh, last June 16 at 10 p.m. So, patient was back riding a motorcycle when the driver suddenly lost balance due to speeding. So the uh, crashed in the gutter and landing on his right side. Patient brought to a local hospital and subsequently referred to our, our institution for further management. So patient is a call center agent uh, with no comorbidities, no food nor drug allergies. With previous hospitalization last 2007 due to a stab wound at his right upper back. Uh, only suturing were done. Then for the physical exam, uh, patient is awake alert, coherent, not in respiratory distress with stable vital signs. With a lacerated wound about 2 cm posteromedial aspect of the right leg uh, with underlying contusion. Also a deformity and swelling of the right leg. Uh, there is limited range of motion. Uh, there is no sensory motor deficit, no foot drop, no pulse noted with a strong peripheral pulses and a CRT of less than 2 seconds. For the gross image, um, you can see a swollen um, anterior anterior knee and abrasions noted. Also here at the lateral, you can appreciate the swollen knee and ecchymosis. On your AP and lateral view of your uh, tibia, uh, tibia. Um, this uh, on your leg, uh, you can see a, a um, 1 to 2 cm uh, lacerated wound. Also, the, um, the uh, swelling of, the, of your knee and um, ecchymosis, uh, which runs along at the medial aspect of your um, uh, knee and your leg. So for the 
of x-rays this is your ap view of your pelvis noted no fracture and or, or dislocation also for your ap view of your um, AP, apl view of your thigh no fracture or dislocations were noted but on your um, ap ap and lateral view of your knee uh, there's a possible uh, chip fracture of your lateral condyle and an incomplete fracture of your uh, sa distal pole of your patella so also a a tibial plateau fracture and a comminuted comminuted fracture of your proximal tibia and on your um, uh, right leg APL, you can also uh, note a segmental fracture of your middle third uh, tibia. And no fracture and dislocation on your um, or syndesmotic injury on your um, right APL. So for our assessment, uh, this fracture open to complete comminuted tibial tattoo, right? Uh, Schatzker 6, um, Holland Moore class 2, AO 42C3, or 42C3, in, and a fracture close complete transverse inferior pole patella, uh, right? AO 34C1. For our plan, uh, emergency debridement and application of knee spanning external fixator, sorry, right? Then also for the de definitive um, uh, treatment, so open induction internal fixation, dual plating of tibial plateau, right, and also or if um, tension band wiring patella, right. Can you go back to your physical exam? Yes, that. Did you assess really the pulses? Is it really strong? Uh, yes, look, um, I appreciate uh, my appreciate your pulses, look. What's the autosats of the leg? About 99%, 98-99%. What are you afraid of in this fracture? Um, compartment syndrome, look. Aside from that, looking at your x-ray. Uh... Uh, the, the, it might, uh, find up for, like, so if so the steel classification mo higher, um, uh, grading the plate, mo gawasang bone, or if not properly, uh, I was not asking of the steel classification. I'm sorry, no. I'm asking you what other things you need to consider based on the fracture. Uh, kind of popliteal uh, uh, vessels that are disrupted. So you have to consider vascular injuries as well because if you take a look at it, your proximal fragment is a little sharp to that. Mm -hmm. So always monitor these patients. And why is the chip fracture on the lateral condyle, lateral condyle not part of your diagnosis? I'm sorry, Doc, I'm not sure if this is a chip fracture or part of the of the distal pole of the patella. Huh? Uh, this is your patella, <coughs> patella data. So, at the lateral view, uh, there is a uh, incomplete fracture of your uh, inferior pole of the patella. Sorry, Doc, my mistake, Doc. So, um, for so, our... Before I start watching, Joey, go back to the leg. Yeah, yes, Sorry, Doc. 
leg ni actually ayo do <clears throat> is there a role for doing a prophylactic na kwan what have you read so the incidence of compartment syndrome in uh, Schatzker's six patients and the role of kanang prophylactic na pasotomy I'm sorry to call ka about ko na ano. Ikaw okay. Okay na. Um I was said on okay last week pa siya sa mga sa doctor. I think it uh in our session I think uh kana serial monitoring sa compartment ng the blood pressure. Uh especially uh If, uh, if you don't have a, you don't have the, uh, um, com- uh, the, the compartment syndrome, uh, the, 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 the intra, intra compartment the monitoring system, you can, uh, do the serial monitoring via the clinical user. Yeah. Ken, okay, so how do you define the um, compartment syndrome based on that little intercompartmental pressure you just said? Uh, it would be a uh, uh, delta C, which is the difference between your uh, intracompartmental pressure and your diastolic pressure. If it would be greater than 30 for three hours, it would define your compartment syndrome, acute compartment syndrome. Greater than 30? And then it's the difference between your uh, diastolic pressure and your intracompartmental pressure. You might want to read it again. Oh, okay. Dapat with in 30 na siya. Yes. Yeah, yeah. na approaching na ang imuhang ang uh, intercompartmental pressure sa mga diastolic. Meaning na wala na gas exchange may tabo if po. May equalize na siya sa imuhang diastolic pressure. Muna ipasabutan na niya. Okay. Okay. So you can um, because it's a high energy nga 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 trauma. What are other injuries in patients? Cervical, pelvis, chest. Ah, uh, wala radok, wala na po negative ramon pelvic up test to. And upper extremities were unremarkable. Na. So what are cardinal signs of compartment syndrome in patients? Uh, with regard to that, uh, like, uh, well, there's slight pain, but it's not out of proportion to the injury. And then there's uh, necrosis, necrosis, or something like that, or some paralysis, or paralysis, or something like that, or some of them. Okay, let's turn it over. You have to monitor these cases. Um, so for our next admission, ah, com, uh, com management. Uh, sorry, before you proceed, you need to spanning, spanning to you can. Yes, that means spanning that to regain uh, the life no? and to allow for temporary healing of soft tissue. Before the clinical management. Can you get your attention band on Kwan? Patella? Ah, no, it's okay. Uh, the clutch wiring thing. The roha is in plan good. For our First, uh, co-management patient, SC, 64-year-old male, came injured to non-healing wound, right foot. So for the history, six months prior to admission, uh, patient sustained a wound on the right foot when it was hit with a stone. So there is no consult done, no medications taken. Three months prior to admission, uh, noted gradual increase in size of the wound, 
but still no consult done and uh, condition tolerated. One week prior to admission, wound now noted to have a prudent discharges. So worsening of the condition prompted consult and was eventually transferred at our institution for further workup and management. For the past medical history, uh, no known comorbidities, no food or drug allergies, uh, non-smoker, occasional alcoholic beverage drinker, no history of previous hospitalization, nor prior surgery. For the physical exam, uh, patient uh, is kind of um, awake, alert, coherent, not in respiratory distress with stable vital signs and a wet gum green on right foot with noted erythema on the surrounding skin with multiple sinus tract formations, a medial and plantar and lateral aspect of the forefoot and hind foot. Also an auto amputated third digit. So in um, a ankle breakout index of one, a minofilament test score two over 10 with pinprick test um, on plantar area negative. Uh, Oculus tendon are remarkable, and also there's negative uh, burgers test. Very strong pulse on the right popliteal area, also so right dorsalis pedis, uh, faint uh, pulses so right dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial artery, with a CRT of 2 to 3 seconds. So here we can uh, see the um, wet gangrene on the right uh, lateral foot, and also erythema of the surrounding skin. Um, also, the auto amputation of your third uh, third digit. Also, a mu multiple sinus uh, tract formation on your plantar and lateral aspect of your uh, forefoot. So um, here we can see the wet young green and the multiple sinus sinus uh, track formation. So these are the current medications. So for our assessment, uh, wet gangrene, right foot, secondary to diabetes mellitus type 2, Wagner 5, uh, UT3D, King's College, uh, stage 5, Wi-Fi 320 or 320, uh, PEDIS score of 8 uh, to consider diabetes mellitus type 2. So uh, recently, na, kuan lang siya, na diagnosed as diabet diabetic. So for the plan, uh, for BKA, right? Uh, possible AKA for risk, risk assessment uh, for daily dressing and also pending pa ang labs and x-rays. So uh, for our next patient, uh, TC, 59-year-old male, uh, came in due to difficulty in ambulation. So for the past uh, medical history, uh, patient uh, one year and three months prior noted right breast mass. So patient opted uh, not to consult due to fear of the COVID pandemic. One year prior, persistence of breast mass led to consult and thus workup was done. So. Uh, uh, they did a tissue biopsy and a mammogram. So mammogram revealed dense lesions at the right breast with skin thickening with, uh, with micro calcification. So bilateral enlarged um, axillary lymph nodes. So upon follow-up of uh, biopsy result noted invasive lobular carcinoma, uh, nothing hum histo grade 2, negative for lymph uh, vascular invasion. Uh, patient advised for um, ARPR testing but eventually lost to follow-up. So one month prior to admission, noted uh, onset of difficulty in ambulation due to weakness and right lower extremity associated with intermittent neck pain and occasional ra radicular pain on the left lower extremity. So patients sought consult with an AP, AP where um, further workup was done. So patient was eventually advised for uh, radiation therapy of the neck and, con and to consult with an orthopedic surgeon but also did not comply. Six days prior prior, so noted difficulty in uh, defecating and urination due to uh, the uh, patient uh, sought consult. So FBC was done, patient was sent, sent home with polycatheter. Three days prior, patient still uh, without stool, so uh, went to this, uh, thus the patient went to our institution for further management. So upon admission, lab workup was done, uh, noted electrolyte imbalance, 
So the splurge replacement uh, given. Patient referred to a palliative care for uh, advice and pain relief. So patient was eventually referred to our service for uh, right-sided for the right-sided weakness. For the physical exam, uh, patient is alert, standing, uh, febrile, not in distress, uh, able to sit up uh, with support. So stable, vital signs, no cervical nor inguinal lymph adenopathy, with a um, six by ten by twelve nodular firm movable breast mass with injury uh, and treated of uh, overlying skin. So there's also a sinus trap formation at the right axillary area with lymphadenopathy, um, no abdominal mass noted, no sensory deficits. For the motor strength, so uh, C5, uh, C5 and C6 is 4 over 5, then until C7, so 2, 2 over 5 and 5 over 5. And below that, C8 to, to T1, so 0 over 5 is uh, right, right, uh, right side. But uh, among L2 to L to S1, um, na deficit lang is ang right side, which is only four over five. Um, the the left side kay uh, unremarkable retina. So negative Bobinski reflex, but with a positive clonus sa right. So for the uh, digital rectal exam, so there's intact uh, perianal sensation, weak sphincter tone, no masses, and brown staining exam in the examining finger, no blood stain also and a positive bulbo cavernous um, reflex, cavernous reflex. For the BCV, what, why will you get the BCV? Is this a trauma patient? Uh, no, look. Uh... It's my purpose of BCV. To check for um, kind of, uh, spinal shock. Hindi man siya trauma. So you can get your ano lang, um, uh, inner sink per contraction. Pero ang BCD, uh, no din na. Ah, sige doc. Sige, sige. Other reflexes? Like for the upper extremity? The kind of katong Hoffman test, eh, doc. Tells. Okay, you have deficits in your upper extremity. Okay, C7, C8, T1. If you're thinking of myelopathy, cervical myelopathy. Oh, we did do a sterling test in the face. We will be continuing the MRI patient now. There's already a lipastic of the C4 over the C6 block and then complete analytic erosion sa C5. I think it would be uh, uh, harmful, harmful to the operation. Okay, and question for you, Joey, about the spinal shock. Sorry, look, no, no, if um, after trauma, bali if no, uh, mag hypotensive ang patient or there is already uh, bradycardia, so ma consider natin siya as in a kind of spinal cord na injury, so it will eventually lead to spinal shock, though. Um, you read the, the definite term for that. Huh? It's okay. always thought by the interns. Diba ko sa nang mga interns na na. Also for the interns, you know this na. Okay. Next. So, radionuclide bones can 
findings. So, kani, there was uh, satisfactory skeletal uh, labeling. So, the kidneys appeared and remarkable. And so interpretation, there is osteoblastic activity in the posterior right eight to nine ribs, um, highly suspicious of metastatic uh, bone disease. Also, MRI were taken. So, there is a near complete lytic erosion of C5 with marrow replacement changes at the adjacent C4 and C5 with pre and paraspinal soft tissue mass lesion, as well as more focal abnormal marrow infiltration at the right pedicle and laminae of T6, L2, L3, and L5 vertebra. Uh, metastatic disease is the primary consideration. So also a posterior subluxation of C4 over C6 uh, with uh, central extradural compression of the cervical cord. So there's no, no demonstrable uh, intradural abnormality. So these are the, the result of your MRI. Are the one with uh, the one with images of the uh, of the spine and shown here is the uh, spine surgery. Okay, again, uh, if which one is T1 and T2? The more you want to go along, T1 and T2. Okay, uh, and then, sorry, sorry, for the T2 are the ones with uh. The, the the one where you can the 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 spinal the, the CSF is darker the the second and the the, the middle images the apologies now is jumbled. It's the T one read images and then the ones in the periphery where we can see the more hyper intense uh, uh, spinal fluid along with the vertebral discs are the T one T two read images. Uh, Marag balik again. Uh, is lang, as ang uh, what is hyperintense signal sa kanang sa spinal cord of T1, T2? Ang motion. T2 is hyperintense. Hyper. Uh, parang it was or increase intensity sa sa CSF, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, I'm not sure if it's uh, associated here, but then the you can see for the first image the uh, the the mass from the the mass of the level of uh, C C four C five and C six compressing upon the uh, spinal uh, the spinal canal. And then we'll we'll be reviewing the uh, coronal test. Okay, what well, okay, X rays? Yeah, that we have taken for the um, X rays. Just X ray. Okay. This is the this is supposed to be the uh, coronal view of the left na uh, lung parenchyma doc showing you uh, uh, nodular lesions of the uh, left uh, lung parenchyma multiple nodular lesions. These are uh, HL facts about the level of the uh, C5 C uh, showing, you, uh, sh showing you the paraspinal lesion along with the uh, level again. Uh, Okay, this was supposed to be around C4, C5. And then you can see uh, an edema about the, uh, in your T2 wave image on your uh, lower uh, left, you can see uh, edema. 
bring about compression to the spinal cord. And then in your other images on the front part, you can see multiple uh, nodular lesion, para, uh, para spinal nodular lesion. And these are just images sa atong best showing you already infiltration of the skin. Of the, the best mask with already infiltrating the skin and associ associating with the sinus tract formation sa uh, right axillary lymphoma. So this will be a, a cervical compressive myelopathy of C4 to C6 secondary to metastatic spine disease, secondary to the uh, primary breast cancer stage 4 uh, with along the hypothalcine of malignancy, DN5. So we ordered for a space and CT scan for a cervical and cervical numerous time. And then so if, if this were uh, one that we could do on a clear cervical carpectomy and fusion of uh, it's C C three to C seven. However, for the I N, they're leading they're leaning more on palliative management with the patient, and then uh, G S still to make more. Now, what's the what are the other scoring scenes? What are the purpose for the scene scoring and the uh, Tokohashi? I think I I need to read on uh Takahashi a lot and things kind of not familiar. Okay, and then the they're planning for palliative nano? Yes, yes, yes. Now what's the life expectancy for this patient? Uh, I I also read on on that last one. Diagnostic with a stage for a metastatic lung disease. Yeah, the pagano. This was when it's ang ano. The I am. Yes, lock man. This was like this was when it's ang palliative care. Good. For our last admission of. Patient RT, 35 year old male, uh, came in due to a kind of uh, pain on his uh, right, uh, right kind of uh, distal forearm. So, so this is a work-related injury happened last uh, June 17 at 6 p.m. at Mabolo, Cebu City. So, patient's right wrist was hit by a falling glass while uh, working in a construction site. So, that's sustaining the injuries. So. Patients had consult at the district hospital and referred to our institution for further management. For the past medical history, patient is kind of, uh, right-handed, a construction worker, no comorbidities, no food or drug allergies, no previous hospitalization nor, nor surgery. For the physical exam, patient is awake, alert, coherent, not in respiratory distress with stable vital signs. So no limitation of elbow range of motion. There is a um, deformity of the right wrist with exposed distal ulna and a limited range of motion to the right wrist also. So no sensory motor deficit with a strong peripheral pulses and a CRT of less than two seconds. So these are your gross image of the patient's uh, right arm and right wrist. So you can see a deformity of the, of the distal distal forearm and also a fragment of your proximal ulna uh, protruding 